I'm heading along the Gallagate, away from Glasgow centre and towards the wild, wild east of the city. This is a lawless area where locals are preyed upon by gangs of cowboy developers and corrupt officials. Two buildings dominate the horizon, sticking out like tombstones, two relics from the 60s that hundreds of people once called home. Due to years of neglect, they are no longer fit for human habitation and they are now almost completely empty. They are considered embarrassing reminders of what is supposedly a bygone age of public housing, community and socialism. These are the White Vale and Blue Vale Towers, otherwise known as the Gallagher Twins. They're kind of special. They were at a certain moment in time where Glasgow City Council was building a lot, masses and masses of public housing. And Glasgow was seen as kind of a major site of the modernist housing revolution in the 60s. Astronomical amounts of public housing was built and a lot of it wasn't very good in terms of its architecture and design and building quality but still at the same time I think there was an attempt to house people who didn't have a lot of money. You know, it was a generous, social democratic gesture in some ways. Much of this part of town is empty. People have been cleared out, leaving only broken down warehouses and fenced off waste ground. Next year the Commonwealth Games will come to this part of the city and this has triggered a frenzy of demolition and construction. I think overall a question that a lot of people need to ask is what does regeneration mean? And you know, there's a lot of literature on this now and a lot of research being done to suggest that regeneration is just a euphemism for gentrification with nicer language. And if you look at overall structurally what's happening with the UK economy now, massive, massive, massive decline in manufacturing and in industry. And Glasgow is a really very, very core example of that. It's an old industrial city that's had to develop a different type of economy and that economy now is predicated on a lot of speculation on urban land and property and I think you need to see the Commonwealth Games and the whole Clyde Gateway regeneration for the East End as part of that, as part of that process. This is the West End of the city here we can see over my shoulder. Traditionally the West End is where the wealthy would have situated themselves. The reason for that is that like most cities, the wind blows from west to east. So in the Victorian times, all the smells and the odours of a big city that hadn't fully developed sewage and sanitation would have headed from west to east. So the rich obviously wanted to avoid all the ill odours of the Victorian age. You can see the skyline in the West End has got lovely towers and spires and architecture and a real sense of tradition. Whereas the east end of Glasgow tends to have tower blocks and empty spaces. So from this angle it's actually hard to imagine that these are the tallest buildings in Scotland. You can see them just over my shoulder, just peering above the tenements here north of Duke Street. As you can see just looking around, uh, these are all kind of townhouses, most of them are bought, most of them are owner-occupied uh, or privately let. Whereas down the other side, it's mostly kind of social housing or housing which isn't actually getting used at all. This is Duke Street. Uh, once we cross this, our life expectancy will go down by about 10 years at least. And it is ironic that they're bringing the Commonwealth Games to the area of the city which has got the lowest life expectancy in Britain.
regeneration creates a massive amount of disturbance. So a lot of people are living in conditions for five or seven years where the whole environment is in a deteriorating condition. Heading off to the 29th floor of the Bluevale Flats, when I'm going to meet a guy called Willie, who is one of the last residents still to be living there at the moment. She's yeah, ironing back with the butter. Aye. Just there, Bruce. You get stuck in the rust. <laughs> as we were, uh, as we were coming up to see Willie, Willie's partner Irene was stuck in the lift, and as we were coming out the lift, we could hear her shouting but we couldn't hear what she was shouting and so not knowing the area too well and being the big kind of brave guys we were we ignored it and ran away as quickly as possible because <laughs> we thought that there was some kind of uh, mad person it's a few people who are leading the one stairs is it? no uh, don't go and leading the one stairs that's horrible imagine living people with kids and stuff you know did they, they, um, did they still come up the back of the stairs and go in there you used to be walks on them. Right. And you did your own yield key again. So there's something you see. Right, they're just open so people can just come up and... Somebody stole the power cables. <laughs> <laughs> 26 and 27 and 28. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's floor 26 up to floor 29. 29. I stole the power cables. Uh-huh. Still another one of it now. I used to go out there. So basically what they're doing is they're stripping it. Aye. And this is not this, first is, just this is just people coming in in the middle of the night? No. Certain people would stay up the floor. <laughs> Aye. Mm -hmm. So you're 29 floors up, and you're getting the electricity. Mm -hmm. That's a wee bit funny though, isn't it? <laughs> Aye, you got a cup of tea. <laughs> You can actually see the birds flying down below you from up here. And uh, I'm not scared of heights, but I have to confess that when I look over the edge here, I do get a little bit queasy. Sometimes I can make my day get a wee bit. Yeah, just, like yeah you feel alright, and then you, it's when you move, isn't it? Yeah. You just kind of go, oh. You've seen the dog comes out, you've got to watch because she runs up and down, because she trips you up. Because she gets under your feet. Yeah, you talk about that, It's amazing the view you get from up here in terms of the perspective of Glasgow. There's a the Redwood Flats up there. See just over there, the Royal Infirmary. It's uh, Celtic Park. This is where Celtic play. Um, the first British club ever to win the European Cup. Uh, and they've done it with 11 players, all born within 15 miles of this stadium which has never actually been done before or since. And so it is a wee bit of a feat to win the European Cup with, with what was basically a district football team. You know, 11 Glaswegians, absolutely no imports required. This is a statue of the Celtic manager, Jock Stein, the very man that put together the 11 boys from Glasgow that went to conquer Europe's best in Lisbon and bring back the European Cup to the east end of Glasgow all those years ago. A pretty impressive character actually, he worked down the pits to his late 20s even though he played football um, and that's probably where he learnt most of what he did about teamwork 
and of course he then went on to marry Celtic, take them to the European Cup. The famous Bill Shankly once said that Jock Steen gets all the players to do the little things they can do and melds it together like a team. He says it's a form of socialism, but without the politics. The last 15, 20 years has seen quite a lot of changes at Celtic Park. Not only have they built this super stadium and achieved quite a lot of success on the football side of things, particularly in Europe, but one of the costs of that has been that many of the people that actually live in the East End that would traditionally have come to support Celtic can no longer afford to get into the ground to see the games. Uh, the other thing you can see is, to an extent, the kind of history of Glasgow because there's lots of spaces that you can see from up here that were clearly part of the industrial past but have never been, they've never really found a new use for them. Like over there, um, you can see an old warehouse and there's a big green space. Now in any other city that would have been developed uh, because it's pretty close to the centre so it must be worth quite a little bit of money. You can see all over the city these kind of gaps that were obviously once filled by a kind of thriving industrial uh, complex of factories or there's a forgery uh, used to be around the corner, the shipyards were just over there, um, rail works, etc. Uh, and they've not quite found a new use for all these spaces in the city yet. To me, that's a very, very clear rent gap line. So this area then is seen as a very, very attractive area for kind of profitable investment because the land values are low so you can buy cheap and hopefully turn a profit over. So these flats were built in 1968, 44 years ago, which incidentally is the year that I was born. And they're now talking about knocking them down uh, because they've got structural problems, uh, a bit like myself. So I just hope that they're not also talking about knocking me down. Demolition is big business in Glasgow. Watching your home getting blown up is a popular way to spend a Sunday morning for many Glaswegians. Although I warn you that it's not the best thing to do if you've got a hangover. But when the dust settles, what are we left with? When you run down an area, then you can present yourself as the white knights of regeneration. So in the East End, what we've seen for a long, long time is a lot of territorial stigmatisation, uh, deliberate blighting and disinvestment, so that the area in a lot of places is, is unattractive. You know, there's a lot of old brownfield sites, there's a lot of gaps, you know, there's a lot of uh, rundown social housing. So in some senses, this creates the condition then for regeneration to emerge, you know, as, as a strategy that people get on side with, you know, and it seems like it's something that's going to be good for everybody. Here's someone who hasn't benefited from this regeneration. Her name is Margaret Giaconelli. This, this is your artwork, is it? That wasn't mine, somebody's done it for me. I stayed at uh, where the Conwell Village is in the East End. I lost my house uh, due to the village getting built. I've been displaced for two and a half years and still uh, working and fighting to get justice for us and justice for everybody else under compulsory purchase. A compulsory purchase is an old law dating back to 1845 and it's ridiculous, it's terrible. It actually gives the councils, not just a Glasgow a Control Council, it gives all councils the power to take your property off you. The council came in and said that they were taking our Palmer building down. Now our building was a red sandstone Victorian building and it was solid. The, they said it would last for 150 to 200 years and we've got document proof that it would last that length of time. But the council needed it for where the Conwell village was. So they decided to demolish the red structure sandstone and they demolished the area. So what they've done is they wiped out the area. I've said it all along. The new name for the 
regeneration is the clearances. This is the 21st century clearances. Just like the layers of Rassi, Noida and Kildonan, the landowners in Dalmarnock, Parkhead and Gallagate realise it's more profitable to get rid of their tenants, destroy their homes and turn the land into a play park for the rich. So this is a velodrome, which was personally built by Sir Chris Hoy, the big-legged cycling cereal seller. For hundreds of years now, the East End of Glasgow has been veloless, which has led to things like malnutrition amongst the children and low life expectancy. But hopefully, with the introduction of this, uh, that's going to all turn around over the next 10 years or so. I wonder how many people in the East End will actually be able to afford to use these facilities. Particularly people on low incomes, unemployed, folk that are suffering from poverty. A lot of people don't realise, realise they think big sporting events, oh it's great and it's going to leave a legacy. But when you look at the legacies and the sporting events all around the world, there's been left with no legacy. And you need to doubt that, are we going to get legacy? That's another thing. I suppose the central claims is that there will be a legacy for everybody that comes out of the games and that will be, you know, kind of the social benefits and <clears throat> social justice. A lot of people are not benefiting, a lot of people are being displaced, um, that compulsory purchase orders are being used very, very discriminately so that people who don't have access to lawyers and lots of funds don't have the ability to fight against compulsory purchase orders and aren't really able to reclaim the value of their homes, whereas large-scale property developers are actually making a lot of money out of the process of selling on land. So what do you think about moving then? Are you sad to be moving or are you happy to be moving? A wee bit of beef. A wee bit of beef. Why? What's, what, what, what are you ha happy about? Getting a better house, but we don't want to move if you need it. We don't. Mm -mm. We've got to move. We really don't want to move. But there's no option, that I mean. I prefer to stay up here. Honestly, I don't. Honestly, mm -hmm. the is just put mere heating into the houses and dare them up. You know, I think some of the, the conditions of the high-rise blocks is poor. But I think what we have to look at is the levels of maintenance or lack of maintenance for those blocks. Oh yeah, it would be so beautiful if you just let us be. Uh, we've come down here to Glasgow Green today because there's a wee demonstration taking place. Now, what's interesting about the demonstration is where it's taking place. Not only is it in Glasgow Green, which is historically the kind of people's park of Glasgow, but it's situated here next to these clothes poles. This is, leads down to the old flesh I saw here. This is a thing that Glasgow Council tried to sell off in 1990. They tried to sell it to private enterprise, basically which is a third of Glasgow Green. But traditionally this is where the people of Glasgow, the women folk, this is why it's appropriate. This is where they came to do their washing. That's like that's the symbolic nature of the clothes poles, you know. These issues, whether it's uh, the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games or something like the city of culture, these are all, it's the old story again about uh, public loss and private gain, essentially, you know, those things, all they do is kind of regenerate uh, or give a, an additional po a possibility or potential for uh, 
for private, uh, for profit. One of the things they did out in Dalmarnock, you know, like the D centre out there was was closed in order to make way for a car park, for a temporary thing. That is very reminiscent of what happened in the City of Culture here. I mean, things throughout Glasgow were, were taken, community centres and so on, funding was stopped and these things, all the money was channelled in to uh, kind of uh, events and so forth that appeared to be national or international in outlook. So in order to create these kind of international projects, they get rid of all the, of so much indigenous stuff that was actually operating for the people of Glasgow. Do you think there's a sense that everything's going backward, you know, particularly in the last 30 years in Glasgow? Uh, yes. And, and, by that, and by that I mean uh, housing, social, uh, social well, wealth, well, that's the way it's everything been, that's been fought for. That's been part of national policy, right, so you might say since the late 70s. The problem people have here in Glasgow is that the people who should be, people, again, these are supposed to be representative of a political position. The councillors are supposed to represent, especially in Glasgow, traditionally it's a Labour council. Traditionally, Labour is supposed to take on these issues on behalf of the people that they represent. Um, Arshanks pointed out that it was quite possible for the Glasgow Labour Party to all right, implement Westminster laws, but to also privately or openly demonstrate against them and argue against them. In the matter of the poll tax, um, the Labour Party didn't. It actually sent in uh, to, <coughs> by warrant seal, somebody had refused to pay. There was a huge gathering of neighbours and the warrant seal had to be abandoned by popular support. The only other peaceful demonstrations, all the other demonstrations in Scotland against the poll tax were absolutely peaceful. Had no effect, totally ignored by the Westminster government, but a year later they started imposing it in Britain, in England, South Britain. Riots in the street! Shops were looted! The government took a... The government took notice of that. It was happening in England, you see. The protests in Scotland were comparatively just about all peaceful, no effect at all. Speaking to Alistair Gray reminds me of the ending of his book, Lanark when the main character climbs to the top of the necropolis to die as the city around him crumbles. His description of an ever-changing city that he no longer recognises somehow seems appropriate. I started making maps when I was small, showing place, resources, where the enemy and where love lay. I did not know time adds to land, events drift continually down, effacing landmarks, raising the level like snow. I have grown up, my maps are out of date, the land lies over me now, I cannot move, it's time to go. And it's no surprise that no forget about me. And if you call